the people of God. Not only serving the people of God, but the people in the world, the community. That's why we exist. And every service you come here, it's, it's just going to be a little unique and, and different because I'm so thankful to think about God is that God isn't old. He isn't mundane. He, he's alive. Uh, could you imagine, you know, uh, going to the house and, and you get the same meal every day and you have the same conversation and you have, you're going to start dreading going there. I'm thankful God is alive. Amen. And so, and so today I, 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 as your pastor, I have to, uh, break down the text and when you're breaking down the text uh, breaking down the word of God rightly dividing the word of God um, it, it's good to teach it amen and so next next week I'm going to be uh, trying my best to preach the house down and uh <laughs> Amen. Last week, that's what I attempted there, but everything has to be in balance. And so you've entered into a balanced church, and so we've got to dig in the scriptures today. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6, last scripture. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And so I want to teach today as Jesus taught, as the apostles taught, and what they taught was the gospel. So I want to preach, teach to you today on that subject, this glorious gospel. This glorious gospel. Can you lay your Bibles down and close your eyes, lift up your hands, let's ask God to speak Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves before you. We have just come to encounter you. We've not come for anything extra with any ulterior motive. God, we just want to know you. And Lord, we have gathered into a building today that we can learn about you, that we can study to know you, God. We thank you for that opportunity. Let the Holy Ghost minister and touch hearts. Lord, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Let the Spirit give life today. In Jesus' name, I pray. (laughs) Amen. Can you clap your hands one more time? Amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This glorious gospel. What we have to understand 
as humans that are made in the image of God is we have to understand that because of the transgressions of Adam and Eve, all of us have been born in sin. Sin is simple disobedience to God. That's all it is. Whatever God says and we decide not to do it, that's, that's sin. And, and it's amazing that you don't even have to know it's sin b- before you do it. Amen. Uh, the first thing you tell your child, hey, don't touch the stove. They're going to touch the stove. No, no one taught them how to be disobedient. It's just, it's just something about our nature to uh, go against or even rebel uh, against the things of God. And so God had a remedy, a, a plan in place to redeem mankind from this sinful nature. Because one thing about sin is that we need something outside of ourselves to cover and help us to not live or walk in that disobedience. <clears throat> we need a supernatural power because how many of you have tried to do right by yourself? I don't know about you, but that didn't work out well for me. I remember whenever I was in college, listen, I was trying my best. I wasn't even saved yet, but I had a hunger for God, and I, and I, and I was trying my best to stop cussing. And, and I didn't even sound right cussing when I was in the world because I, 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 I talked proper. I talk, I talk very proper. You, you, you've heard the story. I had, you know, I had to go to a speech therapist for a year whenever I was in kindergarten because of uh, the trauma and abuse in, in my household. But, but after I left, my mom said, Victor, when you came out of that speech therapy, you came out talking proper. Now, I was born in Louisiana, so everyone has a Louisiana accent. You know, and so a lot of, I got family that talks like this. Hey, come on now, why don't you go over there and get me some green beans? That's real talk. And, and, and so all of my family has a strong Louisiana accent. But here I was, hello, how are you doing today? God bless you. Oh, wonderful. And now imagine that voice trying to cuss. I would cuss and he'd be like, bro, chill. Just, just, you, you don't even sound right. You sound polite. Amen. <laughs> So I was in the world, and I couldn't, I couldn't stop so many sinful uh, uh, habits and things that I'd had, and I was trying my best to do a behavior modification. Like, you know what, I'm going to do this, okay? I'm going to try this. I'm going to treat that. But you know that one thing would happen to be like, ah! I messed up. And I'm like, I will never do this again tomorrow. I will never do this again tomorrow. And over and over, I I realized I did not have power over my sinful nature. I needed a higher power. I needed another power. I needed a greater power. I needed something greater (coughs) to help me overcome it. And that is is when I, I stumbled By the grace of God, I stumbled, but he ordained. That's powerful. I I, I accidentally, he ordained. And and, and it's amazing what we we can stumble into the plan of God. That where you think that you kind of casually walk in today and God's like, I set them up so good. I'm about to change their life so great they didn't even know it. They thought they were just coming to a service and here come. You have been set up. I just came to tell you, God has set you up because he has a plan and a purpose for your life that is greater than anything that you can imagine. And he has drawn you into a place, come on somebody, where you can be changed, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. 
And so I stumbled, what, what God went through to get me saved. That's a, that's a patient, long-suffering God. Because he had to overcome so many things to get me in a position so I could be blessed and walk with him. Now, the issue is, is that a lot of people have heard the word gospel. Everyone say gospel. And I asked someone one day, I asked them, now, let me ask you a question. Like, you, you've heard of the gospel. They're like, yeah, man, the gospel. I said, now, here's my question. What is the gospel? And they said, well, g gospel music. I said, well, that's a good start. But, but what is the gospel? They said, well, the good news. I said, well, well what's the good news? And so and instead of giving people philosophical answers, we've got to go to the Bible. Because the Bible has all the answers. So... So people don't know what the gospel is. And Paul said that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In other words, Satan's desire is to make sure you never hear the gospel. His desire is to make sure you and your family never hear or see or obey the gospel. But somewhere, God has decided on a Sunday morning in April to make sure the devil doesn't interfere. That's why you were attacked on the way to church today. That's why your car wouldn't start. That's why you was fighting in the car all the way to church. Come on, somebody. Because hell was afraid of what you were about to hear because when you hear the gospel you will never be the same again so so how important is the gospel let's go to the bible romans chapter 1 verse 16 he, paul said it this way for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the jew first and also to the greek he says the gospel saves us the gospel saves us the gospels if the gospel is what saves us i want to know what the gospel is and i don't want to hear what what somebody's a perspective has to say about what the gospel is. I want to know what the scripture has to say about the gospel because the gospel is what saves us. Everyone say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. And whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of our of your salvation and whom after that ye believed ye were sealed with that holy spirit of pro promise here it goes again the gospel is what saves us so if it's what saves us i don't want to hear what man has to say if it's what saves us i don't want to hear what culture or any anything else has to say i want to hear what the book has to say because the bible has been inspired by god these are god's words to you the gospel is what saves us if it's what saves i want to know what that is i can't i can't just walk around saying it's the good news what is the good news well the best way to find out is to go to the go to the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Here it is. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Everyone say the gospel. Which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Verse 2. By which also ye are saved. Again, he says it again. The gospel saves. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Verse 3, look what it says. For, here's the gospel. Here, I'm giving it to you. Here it is. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He says, listen, I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. Number one, Christ died. Number two, Christ was buried. Number three, Christ rose again. That is the gospel. Somebody clap your hands and thank God that that's the gospel. Now, 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 now the question is, is now that I know what the gospel is, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and that he rose again, he resurrected, the question is, is it enough to just believe that? Is it enough to just say, hey man, I believe it. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again. Hey man, is that enough? Here's the, how we're going to answer that question. The Bible. Isn't the Bible awesome? All right, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. Here it is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey. Everyone say obey. That obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, it's not enough for you to just believe the gospel. He said, you have to obey the gospel. Now, how in the world do I obey Jesus Christ's death? How do I obey his burial? How do I obey his resurrection? Do I have to die? Do I have to have somebody come bury me? Do I have to have family come and pray that I rise again? No. How do we obey the gospel? Let's go to the Bible. Isn't the Bible awesome? Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. This is after Paul was preaching to the church about the grace of God and how abundant it is and where sin did abound, grace doth much more abound. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The first part of the gospel is the death of Jesus Christ. Hey, look what he says. Those that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So here Paul goes through the gospel, the obedience to the gospel. He said, listen, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. He said, you obey the death by dying out to sin. That is repentance. You obey the burial by being baptized in Jesus' name. You obey the resurrection by walking in newness of life. That is the power of the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you. He said, you obey the gospel by these three steps. Dying out to sin. Repentance. Everyone say repentance. Repentance is saying, God, I'm sorry for my sins. God, I turn away from my sins. I turn away from my sins and I turn my heart, my mind, my spirit, my will to you. That's repentance. Being buried with him by baptism into death. Baptism is a burial. It's, 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 it's a burial. It's, it's, it's not a sprinkle here or there. It, it is a burial. The Greek word for baptism, it's baptizo, which literally means to submerge or immerse. When you get baptized in Jesus' name, you get immersed under the water. And then you raise up, rise up through the newness of life, through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, is this important? 
Is this important, this obedience to the gospel? Look what, look what Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Look what it says here. G G these are Jesus' uh, Jesus last words to the disciples, um, some of his last words after he resurrects. Look what he says. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Are you hearing the word of God this morning? And, and this is, see, see, today what I'm doing is, is I, I'm going through the scriptures. I'm going through the word of God. because And what's happening is, as I'm teaching, is that the mind is being enlightened by the scriptures. The mind is being illuminated by the word of God. Can I tell you, when you obey the gospel, you will never be the same again. Because it's not just you fighting against that addiction. It's not just you fighting against that temptation. Now, it's the power of God on the inside fighting on your behalf. Come on, somebody. And when you get baptized in his name, he puts his name on you to let you know that you're his possession. And the devil better stop messing with his possession I want to go to Luke chapter 24 and, and we're, 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 we're getting we're getting through some things here Luke chapter 24 some of Jesus last words before he ascends here it is Luke chapter 24 and verse 46 and he said unto them Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, Jesus preached the gospel. He preached it. The obedience to that gospel wouldn't happen after Jesus Christ ascended back into heaven. Where he instructed them to go and wait in Jerusalem until they received the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost could not be poured out until Jesus ascended back into heaven. So they were praying for seven to ten days in the upper room, praying for the Holy Ghost. Praying, the Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit, those are interchangeable words. It's the same thing. They were praying for the Holy Ghost to fall for seven to ten days. A hundred twenty are in the upper room praying for the power of God to fall. And then the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that... The 50th day came, and when that 50th day came, while they were praying, there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They received the gift of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Listen. And when they received the Holy Ghost, they came out of the upper room speaking in tongues. Let me tell you something. It scared the mess out of people. They came out speaking in tongues. There were people waiting on them out, on, on the outside, heard them speaking in tongues. And they're like, what, what y'all doing? What y'all doing? And, and they said this. They said, these men are drunk. They said, they're, filling, they're, they're full of new wine. Peter said, listen, man, we're not drunk as you suppose, but this was prophesied by the prophet Joel in the last days that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall, shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Listen, then what he does is he starts preaching the gospel to them. He says, Jesus died because your sins put him on the cross. But he was buried. And, but after he was buried, he didn't stay buried. He said he rose up from the grave. He rose up with all power in his hand. He preaches the gospel. So, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Look how they responded. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, 
when they heard this, you see, they preached the gospel. They believed the gospel. But look what they said in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and unto the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, now that I know I have a Savior, now that I know that I had a Savior that died, was buried, and rose again for me, he said, they said, now what shall we do? Now that I, I believe the gospel, but what do I do now about it? And a lot of Christians, they get stuck there because they believe in God. They have a relationship with God. They love God, but they're not getting any instructions on what to do after you believe. Because that is the obvious question. What do I do now? I believe him. I believe I believe he's my savior. I believe he died. He's been, but, but I need some instructions on how to live this thing out because I don't want to live for God by myself doing it in my own accord. My, I want to know biblically what are my next steps. So what do we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call and 3,000 people obeyed the gospel and 3,000 people were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins see when you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ he washes every single sin away as if it never happened and you come up out of the water a new creature you come out walking different talking different you don't have to get good to get God no this is what he went to the cross for come on even in your mess even in your destruction even in your pain God is willing to put his name on you and wash it all away hey you don't have to be perfect to come to church you don't have to have it all together to come to church but you can have an encounter with God and leave it up to God to do the change Leave it up to God to do the work. Leave it up to God to do the change. Stop trying to get your life perfect before you obey. Amen. So they obeyed this. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the New Testament pattern. Everywhere they would believe they would get baptized and they would receive the spirit which would empower them to live for God. You see, it's, in tough, it's tough to live for God when you don't have that power over sin because it, it, it comes from another world. It comes from your obedience to the gospel. No matter how much I was trying to live right, I couldn't because there's no power in me. You see, if I could without him, then my flesh gets to glory. But I need something from another world to help me walk how he wants me to walk talk how he wants me to talk come on somebody so they obeyed the gospel now here's the issue the issue is that there are people that strive their best the new testament pattern is to get baptized in the name of jesus christ the New Testament biblical pattern. Everyone say biblical pattern. Everything we preach here is in the book. We will not ever get out of the book. This is the foundation. And so what, what, what you have to allow to do is allow the Bible to challenge you. Everyone say challenge. Have to allow the Bible to challenge you. Be willing to put your presuppositions your mindset, your, your, your cultural thoughts to subject it and put it under the word. And let me tell you something. I, I live like this today. Whatever God is speaking in the book, I come under it. I, I come under it. I, I, I submit to it. I, I obey it. As a matter of fact, I was telling people for years uh, for seven years that we would just, you know, we're just going to have one child. I'm serious. So I would be like, yeah, just one child, man. It was just one, bro. You know, one God, one child makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And then I was reading in Genesis, and he told them, be fruitful and multiply. And I was like, God. And, I, and I realized culturally, I was interpreting another child as a burden. But, but biblically, another child is a blessing. And so I had to put my thoughts, oh goodness, I, I had to put my thoughts, my presuppositions, my cultural background and standpoint and say, you know, Lord, I got to put it under the book. I said, baby, it's time to have another child. So now she's 17 weeks pregnant. Your pastor is trying to obey the Lord. Amen. Now, if you tell me about a third one, you're going to really have to show me some scriptures about a third. <laughs> you're going to really have to break down the Hebrew and the Greek for me on that one. <laughs> but we have to bring our traditions under God's word. So Matthew 28 and verse 18 a lot of people that believe in the Lord, they try to obey God with, with this scripture. It says, and Jesus spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are the gospels on the life of Jesus. At the end of those gospels, he gives them the command to go wait in Jerusalem, go preach baptism, go preach the gospel. And 50 days, uh, uh, 50 days after he, he, di he died, uh, 50 days after Passover, then they went to Acts. And that's where God, they, in the book of Acts, that's the early church. That's the first church in the world. And they received it and they started applying what he said in the Gospels. Now, what he says here in verse 19, a lot of people strive to obey not understanding what he's saying. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And so some people, when they get baptized, they say, okay, I now baptize you in, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And, and they get baptized and they do it because of their faith. They do it because they love God. They do it because they're striving to obey. But they, they, they don't see the full understanding biblically of what Jesus is saying here. Because... He's saying here, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But they obeyed this command in Acts 2, where he says, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Matthew is standing with the, the disciples when he says, get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What is he saying in verse 19? He's saying, go baptize them in the name. Everyone say name. name. Not the names. Not the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. He said the name. The singular name. As a matter of fact, father's not a name. Son's not a name. It's not a name. If I write you a check and I put father on it, if I write you a, if I write you a check, like oh, here's a million dollar check, I'm writing out to father. The bank don't look at you and say, where, where's the name? Watch this. Where is the authority? Hear, hear this. Hear this. 
the name of the Father. Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name. Philip said, Philip said, show us the Father, Jesus. You keep talking about the Father. Philip says, show us the Father. Jesus said, have I been so long time with you and have you not known me? He said, the Father dwells in me and he does the works. Everywhere in the New Testament, they were referred to him as Lord or Kyrios, which in the Greek is Jehovah. Jehovah is the name of the Father in the Old Testament. Jesus was revealing that he was the fullness of God in the flesh walking among them. Okay, watch this, guys. Jesus is the name of the Father. What's the name of the Son? The angel said, thou shalt have a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. You see, the name is tied to salvation. Well, here it is. And the Holy Ghost. The name of the Holy Ghost. Jesus. Romans 8 says that the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ. That, that, that the Holy Ghost wasn't given until Jesus was first glorified. Now, let's get back into the obedience of this scripture. Because not one person in the Bible was ever baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Did you know that? Not one person. And we got to stay in the book, right? Let's go to the book. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Why is that name so important? Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 8, verse 16. Look at this. Acts chapter 8, verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts, Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. There, you see two settings. Wave a hand if I'm helping somebody. Wave a hand. We're getting deep. We're, we're just getting deep. Because we've got to get this right biblically. In, in Acts 10, there was a man named Cornelius that was praying to God, had a relationship with God, was seeing angels from God, but the angel spoke to him and said, you need to go call for Simon because he needs to tell you how to get saved. He has a relationship with God. He, he's seeing visions from God. He has a hunger for God, but the angel said, you got to go get Simon to tell you what you need to hear to be saved. And so Simon comes and preaches to them in Acts 10. Let's just go to Acts 10. He preaches to them in Acts 10 and verse 44. Look what he says. He, he's preaching the, the gospel to them. And then he says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Again, this person that had a relationship with God, see when you get baptized or you get rebaptized in the name of Jesus, it doesn't mean you never knew God or never had a relationship with God. It just means that you are growing in your relationship with God. It just means that you're taking the next step of illumination. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Listen to this, guys. I'm excited about the word of God. Listen to this, guys. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. 
And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. See, these are disciples. They got baptized in the Jordan River according to how John the Baptist was baptizing them, the baptism of repentance. And years later, people were still getting baptized according to the John's baptism. But look at verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had a relationship with God. They had a walk with God. But when they saw enlightenment, when they saw the word, when they saw the mission, they said, you know what? I know I was baptized that way. But you know what? I want to do it the Bible way. I want to do it how they did it. Come on, somebody. Because I am prioritizing the book over my traditions, over where I came out of. I want to do it the Bible way. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Here it is. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Look what Colossians chapter 2 says. I love the book. I feel like preaching already. Colossians chapter 2. Listen to this. Colossians chapter 2, verse Eight. It says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy in vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, and whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead you see in the old testament the sign of the new cup the sign of the covenant with God was whenever they would get circumcised according to Genesis 17 10 they would get circumcised to, to show that they were in covenant with God and so in the new testament my God, I'm going to preach right now. In the New Testament, the covenant sign is the circumcision made without hands. You see, in the Old Testament, they would do circumcision to put off the flesh. But he's saying in the New Testament, it is the putting off of the, off of the flesh, the dead flesh, putting off the sin, putting off the old body, putting off the old man, and replacing the old man with Jesus Christ. And so it is the the circumcision is the sign of the old covenant and the circumcision made without hands is the sign of the new covenant being buried with him in baptism. Now it's interesting because when they would circumcise a child, on the eighth day they would name the child. And on that eighth day they would name the child while they were doing circumcision they would call out the child's name while they were doing the circumcision. You see when you get baptized there's always a name being called over you. And that name shows you what family that you're a part of. Come on somebody. And I'm in the family of Jesus Christ. I'm in the fa I got his name on me. I got his name on me. I've been adopted. I, I cry, Abba, Father. Yeah. 
biblically the, 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 the New Testament response when you come into relationship with Jesus the New Testament response is to be buried with him in baptism it's to repent all you need to get baptized is to repent you need to say God I believe and I repent God I repent I just need your help to live for you I can't do it on my own I've tried it I need your help don't walk out here feeling disqualified don't walk out here saying ah oh, when I get ready when I get my life together you you and me know you ain't ever going to have it all together you need help from another world you need to take on his name you need to allow him his spirit to raise you up again it's the gospel it's the gospel after I got baptized in Jesus name and received his spirit it doesn't mean I was perfect but what it means is that when I fell he got me up again what it means is that even when I wasn't perfect come on somebody he helped me get up because now it wasn't me just desiring to get up but it was his spirit in me resurrecting me come on somebody it was his name on me burying the old man and I'm preaching to people that have been walking with guilt and condemnation and heavy burdens upon your shoulders. And he wants to wash that off of you forever, never to return again. And the way that that happens is when you take on his name in baptism. Today, we have... We have robes, whatever you don't want to get wet. We have robes for you, for those that, that, that want to get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The only thing that can wash your sins away is his name. The only thing that can wash your sins away is when you take on his name in the waters of baptism. If you don't remember how you were baptized, you need to get rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ today. If you were baptized as a baby, can I tell you in the Bible there was never an infant or a baby that was baptized why because salvation is a personal decision it's not your parents decision your parents can't make that decision for you come on somebody everybody had a consciousness that what they were doing was for the remission of sins somebody clap your hands to the Lord Now, 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 let me tell you something. This is, this is just as important as anything I've preached over the past year, year and a half. Now, what, what I do is I declare the whole counsel of God. And to declare the whole counsel of God, y'all, that's going to take a while. <laughs> right? I, I, we're in the Gospel of Matthew. We've been in Matthew on our midweek for a year. But we're, we're going we're gonna to get through every, every book in the New Testament. I'm, I'm telling you, this is a marathon. Y'all going to know so much book, gonna, you're going to be a walking Bible when you get it. <laughs> and, and, so, and so I'm faithfully expounding all the scriptures to you. Faithfully. And so anyone that has been here, you know that I don't always take time to just address this. I preach according to the need. I preach according to as God leads. And God here led me here today and said, you need to build an anchor in people's lives and understand that if, there, if my gospel be hid, it is him to them that are lost. What I don't want anyone to do come in the Bible Center of Orlando is to come here faithfully but leave lost. Come on, somebody. I've got to declare the gospel so you can be found, so the glorious light can shine in your mind, and so you can walk and live for him. Can you clap your hands one more time? Everybody stand to your feet and clap your hands to the Lord. Come on, clap your hands if you're thankful for the gospel. Hallelujah. Now, there 
are many people here that need to get baptized in Jesus' name today. We have robes for you. We went through the, the we finally got the baptistry over here, y'all. Amen. Amen. We got, we got creative. We put, we put wheels on the baptistry. Come on, we got a mobile baptistry. You ain't never seen a mobile baptistry. Come on, somebody. The, the, the reason why this has to be taught and, and explained, number one, is for your salvation. Number two, so you can stand in it so, so no philosophies or vain deceit can ever deceive you. Amen? Because people are going to look at you crazy if they try to tell you, oh, no, it's this way, it's this way. You, you, you say, open your Bible. You, you say, hold on, listen, we're, we're rooted in the book. Right? You are saved, Ephesians says, you are saved by grace through faith. See, grace is God's hand reaching down. Faith is your hand reaching up. So we have robes. Whatever you don't want to get wet, we have robes for you. We're just going to say, now I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And I'm going to dunk you down and bring you back up. You're going to lift your hands and worship. I'm telling you, there is going to be a difference. You see, we identify with his death by repentance. We identify with his burial by baptism. We identify with his resurrection by receiving his spirit. I'm trying to tell somebody here that you can make that decision today. The Bible says they commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. This is, this is something that every one of us need to do. I want us to have a time of prayer before we dismiss. From the front to the back, I want everyone to come up front. We're going to have a time of prayer. And we're just going to pray that the word of God would be illuminated in every heart and every mind. And there is such a hunger for God here. When we come up to pray, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're joining the church or anything like that. It just means you're coming up to encounter God. When you get baptized in Jesus' name, it doesn't mean you're joining the church. It means that you are joining the universal church. We're not baptizing you into our local church. We're baptizing you into the word of God's church Jesus Christ into Jesus Christ so there is an illumination and there is a revelation that is here and I'm telling you we call this church Bible Center because everything that comes off this pulpit has to be founded upon the word of God line upon line here a little there a little and you get it by revelation and and not only re re revelation but your, your pastor does have the education I would be considered according to secular standards they would call me a theologian because because of my two master's degrees I, within my own right, can write my own Greek lexicon and my own Hebrew lexicon because of the studies that I have done in the book. I can write my own commentary according to the degrees that I have possessed. But what I love about God's word is you do not need a doctorate degree to understand it. You don't need a master's degree to understand it. You don't need a bachelor's degree to understand it. He has made it plain he has made it plain mm. Mm. that's why he said the word is nigh even in your mouth I just want you to lift up your hands and I, I want you to just ask God to 
continue to open his word and give revelation and understanding that you might know him I want you to tell the Lord God I want to know you in a deeper way I, I want to grow with you I, I want to know you I want to I, I want to discern your presence God I love you God I love you God I love you God I love you we want to draw nigh to you so you can draw nigh to us God we want to know you we want to have relationship with you we need your spirit it's not by might nor by power but by your spirit God we draw near to you God I'm hungry for you can you just pray with somebody near you right now and just pray over them that God opens their hearts and opens their minds to his word that they continue to grow just thank God with the person next to you that they have a hunger and a desire to know God and to grow this whole church is filled with people that are hungry for God filled with people that have a relationship with God filled with people that want to go to the next level in God God we thank you for your word we thank you for revelation we thank you for understanding we thank you for what you're doing we thank you God in the name of Jesus God we want to stay rooted and grounded in your word rooted and grounded in the book because you're able to elevate us you're able to take us to new heights you're able to take us to new levels God take away the depression today take away the sickness Take it away, God. Take away the hurt. Take away the pain. In the name of Jesus, we want to obey you. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah.